Hey everybody, Dave Hagen here. I hope you've been thinking about last week's episode where we were talking about building wealth, part one. Well, this week it's part two. That's today on the Financial Wellness Podcast. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to the financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, or the TFWP as we like to call it. Oh, we got some interesting stuff this week. I'm coming to you from Topanga, California. Our engineer is coming to you from Van Nuys, California. Beautiful downtown Van Nuys. Nick Appel, I've asked Nick to step in because he's our youthful investor type guy. Nick, welcome. Coming to us from San Diego. Hey, thanks, Dave. As always, great to be here. Great to have you. And our guest, we had the same guest last week and we had to have him come back this week. Coming to us from San Diego, Ryan Steigar. Ryan, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Happy to be back. Great to have you. You know, Today, we're going to talk about the specifics of dividend hunting. And, and before we get into that, I want to have the, the following disclaimer. You know, Ryan, our guest, does not invest money for clients. He does not have a securities license. That is not his goal here today. Ryan is a former firefighter, author, uh, soon-to-be lawyer, and he's going to here to talk about his book, The Dividend Hunter, where he's going to relate to us some of the things that he has learned uh, trying to uh, pursue and, and, and find dividends and, and also build wealth over time. So this is not a show where you're going to get investment advice or specific investment advice. If we talk about IBM or ABM or any kind of BM, we're not making any specific reference or investment advice. We are simply using those by example only. So with that being said, Ryan, let's, let's pick up our, our conversation from last week. I want to get into some of these specifics. But before we do, you talk about the wealth building mindset in the book. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, Dave. You know, the book starts with the wealth building mindset. And when you read The Dividend Hunter, that might surprise you because you open it thinking, okay, good, Ryan's going to teach me about dividends. That happens. I teach you about dividends. But first, you need to have the correct wealth building mindset. You need to understand that wealth is abundant. There are opportunities to make money. And so you need to implement good lifestyle habits now so that you have the money to invest later. You need to know how to keep your income consistent. You need to learn how to keep your expenses low. You need to learn how to free up enough cash flow in your personal life so that when you have an opportunity to invest in a good stock, the money is there. You know, I've, I've said for years that financial success is more about emotion and less about intellect. Do you agree? Actually, I do. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be very educated to be very wealthy. You just have to have the right temperament. And in the book, I even talk about what I call the three temperament rules for success. And if you if you want to learn more about those, it's in the book. Uh, but what it comes down was, was 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 that a pitch? Oh my goodness! Available <laughs> on available on Amazon. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so tell me about, you know, let, let, let's talk about this wealth building mindset a little bit more, because I was just intrigued, like you said, that that would be at the beginning of the book and that the beginning of the book and the end of the book, which talked about wealth building tips that maybe we'll talk about in another episode. But this, this whole, th this whole bit of information about how to find dividends, how to understand stocks, all the technical stuff was kind of bookend by these two emotional pieces. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about that. Because the technicals and, and the sort of intelligent aspect of it doesn't do you any good if you don't have the right temperament and the right emotional state when you start. If you jump on to TD Ameritrade and 
you don't have the right mindset up front, you're going to fall for the traps. You're going to invest in high dividend yielding stocks that are going to stop paying dividends. You're going to invest in stocks that are highly speculative and you're going to lose money. So it's so important to build the mindset. And what I also don't want people to do, especially in 2020 with all the change we're seeing, people are getting frustrated. They think, no, being wealthy, that's only for people born with it. That's just for people with really good jobs. I'm telling you, if you know how to manage a few hundred dollars a month and you apply those principles consistently, you will be wealthy if you just stay the course. Let me ask you this. When the market went down 30% earlier in the year, were you uh, up on the roof standing by the cliff thinking about a <laughs> jump? I, fortunately, I live in a single story, so there wasn't too much risk there. No, but, you would have survived it either way. Yeah. Uh, you know, no one likes opening up their brokerage account and seeing a bunch of red. It's jarring. It's unsettling. It For a brief moment, I, I wondered if I had made a mistake and if everything I knew about investing was wrong. Uh, so I very quickly checked the fundamentals of the companies I was involved in. I was like, did something go wrong here? And what I found, and this is the greatest opportunity for dividend and hunters, the, the market is a very emotional creature. Long term, it rewards good companies, but in the short term, it doesn't know what the value of a good company is. And what I found was the companies I was invested in, their price took a hit, but their financials were fine. They had excellent liquidity. They had low debt. They had great cash flow. They had a good moat. There was no reason for alarm. So what I did is I went on a buying spree, Dave. I, I collected myself. I looked. And once I was confident that the companies were still strong, I went on a buying spree. You and, looked into the mouth of the alligator and went buying? Yep. <laughs> well, you know, when you look into the mouth and you see a strong balance sheet, good cash flow, and, and no real reason for alarm, sometimes the market overreacts. Sometimes the market takes a strong company and grossly undervalues it. And that's your time to strike when you're paying attention. Let me ask you this just as an aside, since we just came through this thing. Do you think the do you think we or do you think the market overreacted? You know, it's hard to say because, you know, some people are calling it the second wave. Some people are saying the first wave never ended. You know, the ramifications of coronavirus and, and everything, it's, it's hard to know what's going to happen in the future. The only information we have is what's before us right now. Uh, for the companies I was in, I think the market overreacted. There was absolutely no reason for a company with very strong fundamentals that has very low debt, very high cash flow, and, and a strong command of its market, there's no reason for its price to drop 50%. I mean, if they had fired a, a successful CEO, if they had made a bad deal, then yeah, maybe the price should drop. But sometimes the market is just being emotional. Yeah, I mean, I think that the market can get very wobbly at times because I think there's so much emotion in it. And that emotion is, is magnified by people that are day trading or that are investing on, on, you know, motion or, 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 or movement. Or hype. And I say or hype. times in my book, avoid hype like plague. It's a good way to get hurt. Yeah. Uh, the goal of the dividend hunter is we're income investing. We're not trying to score 100%, 200% gain on a hot stock. We're not trying to play that game because, yes, there's good rewards, but there's a lot of risk there. The game we are playing is how do I get you another, basically another paycheck for not working? How do I get you money every month without working? And the way we do that is we become part owners in a company. We become entitled to a portion of that company's profits. That's what a dividend is. And if it's a good company, no matter what its price is, no matter what's happening with the price, the dividends are going to keep coming. And I saw that you said in the book, the price of the stock is not necessarily the, the end determiner of the value of the stock or the value of the company, that you had to look behind that and look at the financials and understand the company and what their P&L looks like, et cetera, et cetera, how they sit in the market to determine whether it's really a good company that you want to be part of. Absolutely. You know, something that surprises a lot of people who are investing for the first time is, yes, I care about price because I want to get a good company at a good price. I don't want to spend $80 for a stock that's really worth $60. But when I'm comparing two stocks, price is probably the least important thing I'm looking at. I, I don't really care. You know, but some people are asking me, how do you compare Coca-Cola and PepsiCo? For example, Pepsi's over $100, Coke's in the 40s. How, how do you compare these two? 
like, look, the price of the stock is not the value you are getting. Look at the fundamentals and don't worry about the price. Don't overpay for a stock, but the price isn't really telling you what you're getting. When you just said a good company at a good price, I started to uh, to visualize somebody that we know and love here on the TFWP. And I'm I'm not talking about Brian Reed, although we we love and respect Brian as well. But I was thinking, who was I thinking about, Nick? Me, of course. Well, no, we're talking. You. <laughs> no, uh, you know, Mr. Berkshire Hathaway himself, Mr. Mr. Warren Buffett. Buffett, Warren Buffett, and and his partner Charlie Munger. I mean, that's. I mean, isn't that Warren Buffett to a T? Isn't that Benjamin Graham? We talked about Benjamin Graham last episode. And if you don't know who he is, listeners, go back and listen to last week up ep- last week's episode. But I think that a good company at a good price is the key. And the people that had good companies didn't uh, didn't freak out quite so much. No, and and you know, uh, not bragging, Dave, but I want to know. I want people to know that this works. For example, the securities I hold, my portfolio, I personally experienced two dividend increases in my portfolio. I experienced no cuts and no suspensions. My dividends kept coming. And so, what's really exciting about income investing? Yeah, it's it's not as sexy as swing tradings and option tradings and some of the stuff you're seeing a lot of right now. But what's cool is it extracts you from the chaos of the market. I can kind of sit back and look at all these swings and go, "Wow, isn't that interesting?" But hey, I, I got my dividend checks this month, so I'm doing just fine. But those 100% hits feel so good. <laughs> you know, they feel good, but it, it's almost like, uh, you know, it, it's catching that big fish is exciting, but I like having a, a farm where it's coming to be consistently, it's predictable, I can rely on it every month, and it's more passive. You know, I'm a busy guy, a lot of us are busy and working hard, I just do not have the time to spend four or five hours a day on think or swim trying to predict what's going to happen next. Yeah. It's better for me to do my research on the front end, and then just check in every three or four months and go, okay, you know... Uh, uh, for example, Citigroup. Is Citigroup still meeting my expectations? Is, is Coke still meeting my expectations? And it's okay to fire companies. It's okay to do that. Do you have an investment advisor that you uh, work with or are you doing this on your own? I do this on my own. You know, when I, and this is a good reason I wanted to write the book. When I got started, um, I was very young. I think I was 20, 21 years old. I was in the firehouse and I, I was making money for the first time. I was, I was getting a good paycheck from the fire department and I wanted to do something with it, you know? Uh, and I was talking to some of the guys in the station and they were kind of the baby boomer generation. And they came from an era where the workings of the market were still a very mysterious institution that a lot of people didn't have access to. And they told me, go buy a mutual fund. Don't, don't worry about it. Have a professional manage your money. Get a mutual fund. It's safe. And what I and I started looking around, and what I found when I was a kid, and I was like, wait a minute, these people want to take a bunch of my money uh, to manage it for mediocre returns. You know, mutual fund is a very expensive way to get you know six, seven, eight percent if I'm lucky. So I started looking at other ways to invest, uh, and that's when I came across the intelligent investor. That's when I came across investopedia.com, which is a fantastic resource people should use. And I started to learn more about how to do this myself. Uh, and, and that's when I realized, you know what? It's not the 90s. It's not the 80s anymore. The information is there if you want it. Yeah. Well, though you you strike me as, you know, perhaps a little more intelligent and driven than most, certainly, certainly more than, more than me, but you know, someone should get the book. They should get your book, read it. They should read intelligent investor beating the street. And even then they might want to work with somebody, whether it's a, someone that works on a, you know, brokerage account or or in in a brokerage or something like that, um, or their accountant or be in a group of people where they can talk about these kinds of things um, just to get, get someone or some group to to bounce some of these I- ideas off of don't you think fantastic yeah and, and it really depends on your in individual investment goals you know it was funny dave earlier you and i were talking and you asked why i wasn't invested in amazon you know because of its tremendous performance and i told you it's because it doesn't meet my particular investment goals everyone's a little different and the truth yeah, but is- it's, it's like three thousand a share or something isn't it it's three thousand a share but do you know what it doesn't do dave it does not pay a dividend And that is really my number one criteria. Again, what I'm teaching people in Dividend Hunter and what I do is I buy income. I don't really care to hold a stock that isn't paying me 
a portion of the company's profits. I want to be a part owner and I want profits. Uh, I do store my wealth in things that appreciate. I invest in precious metals. We can talk about that another time if we want, but I, I don't do growth stocks that don't pay me money. Wow. Wow. All right. We'll come back to Amazon in just a few minutes. Cause I've got some, some interesting questions for you on that. You know, one of the other things that you talked about in the, in the book was four sources or six sources of, of income sources of income that wealthy people have. Yes. Um, I wanted to touch on that a little bit and talk about that a little bit. What are, what are those sources, different sources of income that wealthy people have? Great. Well, first, Dave, the average millionaire has four. When you do a, a sociological survey and ask all these millionaires, where does their money come from? Most of them have four sources of income. Not and just a job. Not just a job. The biggest myth that is out there is people think, I need a degree. I need to get a better job. I need a raise. I need this and that. Like A lot of times your earned income is fine. You can be very wealthy with just 50K, 60K a year. Mm -hmm. The goal is to create other streams of revenue that are paying you while you're sitting in your office. They're paying you while you're asleep. They're paying you while you're on vacation. Well, I, I want some more of that. Tell me, tell me more. Well, well let's get specific. The first and, and most powerful one is earned income from a job. I think one of the most destructive pieces of advice I see on the internet is these Instagram pages and TikTok pages that are saying, oh, the nine to five is for suckers. Be an entrepreneur, be your own boss. You know, that's, that's all well and good. But honestly, one of the most powerful assets you have is a steady nine to five that's paying you every two weeks because that is predictable money coming in every every two weeks that you mm -hmm. can use to build wealth. Uh, the other thing is rental income from investment properties. That one is a big one. It takes time to build up to it, but that's the second most common you will see. Uh, also royalty income from intellectual property. When you create something and you charge a fee for someone to use your mind and to use your ideas, you're making money. For example, I have six books on the market. My Snot Rocket series, I get royalties every time a kid reads that book. Uh, and then, of course, there's capital gains from your stock. There's profits from maybe a side hustle. Maybe you're washing cars on the weekends. Maybe you have a Shopify account. You're selling jewelry online. It doesn't have to be big, but it's profit. And then finally, dividend income something where you're taking that side hustle, you're taking that side job, maybe those royalties from an ebook you published, you're putting it into your TD Ameritrade account, and after 10 years of compound interest, every month you're making thousands of dollars simply because you're entitled to a portion of a company's profits. And right. that is the stream I wanna talk about in the book. Yeah, well, I mean, now that you're talking about these, these sources of income, I'm kind of thinking through and you know, being a big Laker fan, uh, they they were built over the years by a fellow named Jerry Buss, who I had the, the pleasure to have lunch with one day many, many years ago. Um, wealthy, wealthy guy. And the word on the street was that he had built his fortune buying and renting out condos and, uh, and apartments. And so mm -hmm. he, he made a lot of his investor friends rich just doing that. And yet at the same time, uh, or shortly thereafter, you know, he bought the Lakers and he hires magic and he, you know, creates this, this juggernaut of a sports team. And yet, even when he was back in the apartment days, he and his business partner were not too proud to go in on Saturdays and clean out the apartments. So they're like swabbing out the toilets while they're building their future. And I think that's an interesting takeaway. You can't be too proud doing this stuff. Yeah, you, you can't. until you're made, you do what you got to do. Yeah, and something I tell a lot of people because I, I hear it all the time. I hear people saying, you know, I, I I hate my job. I don't make enough money. You need money to invest. You need money to invest. And if I only had ten thousand dollars, if only I could win five thousand dollars, all my problems would be solved. And it really is true. If you can't manage a hundred dollars, you can't manage a hundred thousand dollars. And what we heard, learned from your story there is if you are efficient at managing your small business and your small streams of income, you're keeping them streamlined, then when you start making more and more money, you're going to find you're able to keep it. You're able to become more effective over time. Uh, and it starts by being frugal and conservative with the way you're managing expenses early on. And, and another thing I wanted to touch on, Dave, you mentioned the, the rental properties. And a lot of people might stop listening. They think, no, I need 20% down. I need great credit. I, I can't afford that. Uh, there is a fantastic little thing on the stock market called a real estate investment trust. And you can own property or own the uh, income from a property without owning land. And it's very easy to get into it. And I talk about that in my book. I personally do collect income 
from real estate properties, just my owning shares. And those are called REITs, right? Yes, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. They are right. one of my favorite investment tools. Right. So when you heard when you heard me say REIT, it wasn't my my chair squeaking. No. It was uh, it was Real Estate Investment Trust REIT. Yes, yes. I These like are that. companies that own properties, or perhaps they own the mortgage attached to a property, and their whole goal is to pay dividends. They are required by law to issue ninety percent of their taxable income in the form of a dividend. So not only are you owning a piece of rental income without going out and buying land and applying for a loan on your own, you're owning a piece just by buying shares. Mm -hmm. but you're part of a company who by law needs to focus on protecting your dividend. It's pretty exciting. Oh, I like that. You know, one of the things I like about your, your book is you, you start with the basics. When I, when I sit down with someone and talk about their financial situation um, and, we, and we talk about, hey, what could your upside, what could your future look like? And they say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't understand about IRAs or Kios or and a stock and a bond and a, oh my God, a REIT and a, you know, all these different things, PDE ratio. And, and you start with the very basic stuff. I mean, you explain in very simplistic terms in three paragraphs, what's a, you know, a, a stock, what's a, what's a dividend. I'm sure some of our, our listeners we're thinking, wow, what's a dividend? And you, you, you just defined it just about 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about dividend yield and earnings per share. I mean, stuff that, that I'm not really that conversant in. You know, we talked about ETF. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about how to read a balance sheet and an income sheet and a cash flow statement. When I saw that, I went, oh, I didn't take that class in college. You know, I don't know what that is. But you read a couple paragraphs, and if and if you kind of dwell on the, the the mathematical formula that you've put in the book, you go, all right, I get that. I mean, you spend a lot of time talking about PDE ratio, and I found that really interesting because that's a that's something that the commentators on TV always talk about. Well, that's a good one because the PDE is twelve or it's fourteen. It's low. It's good. Uh, and so you know, I always kind of went through life looking at a PDE ratio, and if it was twelve to fourteen, I was going, well, maybe that's a pretty good stock, but, but Microsoft's PDE isn't 12 to 14. And I don't know if Amazon even has a PDE up and well, at least up until recently. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what's a, what's a PDE ratio and, and is, is that still a valid indicator of the, the quality of a company? You know, uh, yes and no, Dave. So when we talk about the PDE ratio, we're talking about the price to earnings ratio. Okay. And a good other concept to think about is EPS, earnings per share. So when you buy a share of stock, you are a part owner in the company. It's very small, but you are a part owner. Mm -hmm. And as such, you are, in theory, entitled to a portion of the earnings. So if we say a company has an EPS of two, that, that means you're generating you know, you know, two, $2 per share roughly. It's a rough way of thinking about it. So when we talk about P to E ratio, we're talking about, okay, for every dollar of earnings, how much are you paying to gain an entitlement to that dollar? It's a basic way of thinking about it. That is why people like the P to E ratio, because we're telling you for every dollar of earnings you become entitled to, how much money do you have to invest to gain that? So when we say that the P to E ratio is 10, we're saying you're spending $10 for every $1 of earnings that you've become entitled to. If we say the PDE ratio is something insane, like 12,000, you're paying $1,200 for every dollar of earnings. So that's what we mean when we say price to earnings. And so you can see logically, we're telling you how much money are you paying to gain access to this company's earnings? And that tells you how much value you're getting for your price. Well, then why would people invest in like Amazon, which is you know, the PDE is like, is, is so incredible. In fact, it didn't even have earnings until what a year ago. Yeah. Why, why would someone, why would someone pay, you know, $12,000 for a little bit of earnings? I don't get that. Well, I could say it in two words. Capital gains is the most obvious one. Okay. Uh, we talked about one of the income streams, profits from buying and selling. You know, there's two ways to look at a stock. You know, there's people like me where I, I typically see a stock as an ownership stake in a company. When I buy a stock, I'm imagining that I'm buying a seat on the board of directors and I'm really going to pay attention to this company and be a part owner. There's other people who view it as a commodity. It's something you take to the marketplace and you're swapping, you're dealing, you're putting options on it and you're buying and selling 
not because you're interested in the earnings of the company, but because you're excited about the value the company might deliver in the future. Uh, and that's a perfectly valid way to make money. It's a very active form of investing that, that I don't personally do. Uh, but people get excited about the future growth of a company, and that's what they're doing. Even though it doesn't pay a dividend, they're capturing the growth potential and they're earning profits in the form of capital gains. But the commentators on TV, all they talk about is, you know, Microsoft up two and a quarter today. And they're, they're looking at the increase in value. Oh, look, you made this much money and da, 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 it's up uh, 2% in the last year, 25% in the last year. Or if you were smart enough to buy some Tesla up 300%, 400% the last year. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> these are people speculating value. These are people that are looking at, at the growth of the company, not the income that the company produces. Of course, I guess it wouldn't be very sexy for a political or a, a, an economic commentator to say, well, you know, there's uh, Microsoft and 3% uh, dividend. That doesn't sound very sexy. No, well, I say it in the dividend hunter too. You know, when you see something like a 3% dividend, which is considered a very healthy dividend. Very good, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it, it's not exciting. You're telling me for every dollar I invest in a company, I'm making $3? That's crap. I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to convince you it's not a small number. The goal of the dividend hunter is you let compound interest do its thing. You are not playing checkers. You're playing chess. You're playing for the long term. You're playing... 10 years from now, what's my portfolio going to look like? And after 10 years of 3% compound interest plus the capital gain, plus reinvesting your dividend, eventually that's going to grow to a massive liquid asset pile that you have that you can draw on if you need the money. But more exciting, it is paying you income every month, every quarter, without you doing anything. So I part, part of your strategy then is don't take the dividend out and spend it on a car. Leave it no. in, reinvest. That's the worst thing you can do. You know, it's uh, um, what I say in the book is imagine you're filling up a bucket full of water, except every five minutes you're dumping out all the water. How long until the bucket is full? Never. If you take those dividends and you collect them right away, you're not letting compound interest do its magic. Reinvest the dividends every time you get them so that 10 years from now, or even five years from now, if you really want to see where your progress is at and do a gut check, uh, Turn off your drip and see how much money you can get every quarter from it. But you have to let it grow first. My goal personally, my investment strategy, Dave, it's why I don't invest in Tesla or Amazon, is I want my dividends paying my monthly expenses consistently all the time, where I will have my earned income from being a lawyer, I have my royalty income from my books, I have my side businesses that I do, but all of my key expenses are covered by dividends. That's my long-term goal. Well, I love having you on the show, but uh, so I'm going to overlook the comment you just made about investing in Tesla. <laughs> big, we're 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 big fans here of of Elon and the Tesla group. But I remember uh, about three four years ago, I was looking at that as a potential investment, and it was so speculative. And then it occurred to me, I'd rather have the car than the stock. Even better, a used car from Tesla than the stock so that I didn't have to worry about so much of the depreciation. And um, of course, now I look back and go, man, I wish I had, I wish I had some more of that stock. But it was the right move, move to make because to a couple of years ago, even they, they, were, they were pretty much on the edge of things. Yeah, you know, it, and, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm an emotional being too, just like anyone else. I experience FOMO, fear of missing out. I look at Tesla now and I remember I briefly owned a few shares back when it was like 150, 160, and I owned a few shares. And I think, man, if I had only held on to that, wow, what would I have done? Uh, but you know just, just to rub it in a little bit, Ryan, because you because you <laughs> badmouth my man. <laughs> it was it was like a hundred bucks. What did it what did it what's it selling for today? Oh my gosh, I think it's twelve. It, no, 15. it's over 15. It's, it's over 15. 1500? Oh my God. The growth rate on that is just insane. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I actually think they just had their uh, 10 year anniversary from their IPO. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, good for them. I am excited about Mr. Musk and everything he's doing, but you know, there, there was a cost benefit. I feel I made the right choice because what's been happening in this very volatile year is I'm reinvesting my dividends automatically, but I do pay attention to how much I, I would be earning if I decided to turn the drip off. And it's it's almost enough to meet my rent. It's getting really close. Uh, wow. And it's very exciting to see those decisions I made a long time ago. Yes, I missed out on massive capital gains opportunities, 
but my dividends are, you know, we're getting close to the 10 years in the market, I think maybe eight years that I started actually going for dividends. I'm getting to a point where, man, if I wanted to, I could turn these off and have a steady check coming in, you know, right. but I'm not going to do that. I'm still young. I'm going to let them keep building. But I, I think what I hear you saying, especially vis-a-vis Tesla, mm-hmm. is that you can live with having missed out on that growth mm-hmm. because at the time it didn't fit in with your overall investment strategy, which was dividend stocks. Yes. Fair to say? Yeah. And you can live with that today? I can live with that today because you know, could, yeah. other, you know someone who's holding even 100 shares of Tesla, they, they haven't earned anything yet. They don't actually lock in any gains until they sell the stock. That's all on paper. Right. And what happened, and it's ironic, the, the more a stock runs up like this, the less likely you are to sell. And that's alarming because this is the time you probably should be selling to lock right. in those gains. Right. But it's not until the bubble bursts or something catastrophic happens, people realize, oh, snap, I need to sell. So, you know, in the few times I have gone for a growth stop, I've done it. I, I've played around with it. I try to use trailing stops to make sure I'm locking in gains as the stock goes up. Right. Yeah. I got to tell you, the last weekend I was walking down the street and I had a very, very significant event in my life. I saw my first Model Y. Mm. Oh, you saw a Model Y? I saw a Y. So I actually saw one since then, a gray one first and then a white one. I got to tell you, it's a nicer car. It is. <laughs> it, 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 oh, my it, goodness. And they're, they're getting more reasonable, too, as you know, as the price is coming down on that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very nice shape. It's, it's well designed. It's on the Model 3 uh, platform. And... Um, you know, he predicts he's going to sell more of those than any other car. And when I finally saw the car, I said, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. But the people that are buying Tesla stock then are either buying it just because they think it's running up. They're just buying on momentum or they're buying because they believe in the future promise of Tesla. Would that be fair to say? I believe that's fair to say. Uh you know, don't expect Tesla to be paying you any portions of profits anytime soon or maybe even ever. Uh, ever, Right. Yeah. Uh, no matter how well it does, it may never pay you a portion of those profits. So you really have to decide uh, what kind of investor you want to be. And I really like being a part owner. I, that's why I love my REITs. I love my big banks. I love my strong companies that have been around a while that prioritize the dividend. Um, I love collecting profits that I didn't have to work for. That's a lot of fun. Well, let me ask you this. what What's better? Um, increase in price or dividends? You know, it's hard to say. It depends on your investing goals. You know, I get excited. I enjoy seeing green. I love seeing the price run up. It makes me feel smart. It makes me feel secure. Uh, But I would much rather see my dividend grow. But I want to see my dividend grow responsibly. So when you read the dividend, Hunter, one thing I tell you to pay attention to is a company's liquidity and its debt burden. How much debt does the company have? And can it really afford to be paying out portions of its profits to you? Uh, so I pay attention to dividend growth. And when a company is increasing dividends every year, I like that, especially when they're keeping their debt reasonable and their profits are growing. That's a very exciting company for me. And you talk about this all in the book. I do. I tell you how to identify what is a good dividend stock. Well, I noticed that there's um, um, some some things in your book where you talk about how to, how to find these dividend stocks. You, you, mm-hmm. you say start out with the Dow. Yeah. And- and that, that's easy. You can find that in any newspaper, internet, whatever. But then you talk about dividend kings and dividend aristocrats. Tell us just quickly a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. You know, I want people to, to not be afraid of the market and have an idea where to start. Everyone's like, I've got money. I don't know where to start. Well, we start with the dividend kings and the dividend aristocrats. These are very exclusive lists. We'll start with the most exclusive. To be a dividend king, this is an industry term. It's not something I made up. To be a dividend king, You must be in the S&P 500, so you must be a large, notable company already, and you must have increased your dividend every year for the past 50 years. To be a dividend king, there's only 29 companies. There's only 29 companies that meet that very strict criteria. To be a dividend king represents that you are an old, established company. You're generally a profitable company, and you're committed to the dividend because you've done growth every year for 50 years. Next is the dividend aristocrat. This is a larger list. This is a company that has raised its dividend every year for 25 years. I recommend people start with these lists to get an idea of 
you know, how do I evaluate dividend paying stocks? Because first of all, these stocks are paying a dividend. So you don't have to sort through these growth stocks that aren't paying you anything. And you can get an idea like, okay, is the growth sustainable? You know, if, if ABM raised its dividend by 2%, 3%, can it really afford to be paying me that? And is it going to cut my dividend later? That's the stuff I want people to pay attention to. Yeah. And I was looking on the list, you know, we, we talked earlier in the show about ABM that that's a real company. It's publicly traded and it's, it's one of the dividend Kings. That's what made me think about it. It is. They're a facility service company. They do things like uh, janitorial services. You've probably seen the logo and maybe not noticed it. It looks like a little blue man with a yellow head. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also have expanded, you know, with the work from home movement, ABM is actually pretty well situated. They've taken a hit but they do data center operation too. They are a diversified facilities service company. Uh, I personally am not invested in them, but they're a strong company with a strong dividend history. Cleaning out uh, restrooms and offices. Money doesn't smell. You know? I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Money don't smell. I like that. No, that's good. That's good. So the Kings and the aristocrats, those current lists are in your book, right? Yes, they are available on Amazon. Who said that? Who said that? You know, later on in the book, you talk about rules to follow for, for long-term wealth. Yes. And um, you know what? We don't have enough time to really dig into that on this episode, but I'm wondering if we could get you to come back for a future episode and spend some time talking about rules to follow for long-term wealth. Uh, you, will you do that for us? Absolutely. You know, when I wrote this book, I, I imagined for that middle portion where we're going over the technicals, I imagined that I'm sitting at the desk with the reader, poking through their brokerage account and explaining line by line what everything means. That's how I imagined it. But when we got to that wealth building mindset part, I imagined I was having a drink at a bar with the reader and saying, listen, you know, I don't drive a big fancy Mercedes. I don't live in a big fancy luxury apartment, but I'm a wealthy guy. You know, I don't hurt for money. And let me tell you how I did it, because you can do it too. It's very but you talked about this concept that true wealth is quiet. It is maybe quiet. That, maybe that's a good finish. Tell us a little bit about that. I know some very wealthy people that mm -hmm. you would never even know. They were driving around in Pontiacs and stuff. Uh, you know, listen, I do indulge in my wealth sometimes. You don't have to be this superhuman, stoic, uh, philosopher type person. You know, what I tell people in the book is, look, when you start making money, indulge in it. You've earned it. You're entitled to enjoy the benefits of it. But be selective, you know. Uh, for me personally, my big thing I enjoy doing is I, I like going to Vegas with my girlfriend. I like traveling, you know, with her. That's what we enjoy doing with our money. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I, I love the Genesis G90 sedan that came out. It's beautiful. And I need, nice. I, I keep checking myself. Nice. To make the monthly payment doesn't <laughs> you spend that money on it because right. wouldn't I much rather have 500 a month going back into my portfolio? And the answer is always yes. Well, and if you're a TFW peer, you wouldn't want to have a, a monthly payment at all. You'd have to pull that money out of your investments. And then that really hurts. So you become a very, very shrewd buyer of transportation. Absolutely. You know, one, one last nugget of specific wisdom I'd like to leave with the listeners is, you know, my checking account is abysmal. It's, it, it, you'd look at the checking account and think that I was on welfare or something. But that the, what happens is I take that money, I put it to work. Most of my money is in some sort of asset that is generating interest for me, or it is generating an, uh, dividends for me. You know, you don't want to keep that money right in your pocket where it can do damage. You know, uh, that, that's the last thing I'd leave people with. Wow. Well, there you have it, everybody. The book is The Dividend Hunter by Ryan Steigar. Two episodes with Ryan talking about tips for life and tips for investing and how to understand what's going on in that stock market available on Amazon. The Kindle version is nine 99. You can download it. The printed version, 1499. I got mine and I'm going to hang on to it. I've already highlighted it. Um, Ryan thought that I was kidding when I said I read the book, but I, I did. Um, and it was a very valuable book. In fact, I, I think I put it on the same shelf with, uh, Oh, uh, so many books over the years. Um, even uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven oh. Habits of Highly Effective People, a book that you go back to again and again and go, what was that? What was that? I'm, I'm getting a little away from that. I need to get back, back down there. So um, again, the disclaimer today is we're getting nothing on the sales of the book, but it's an important book. It's available on amazon.com. You know, 
check it out. I think it's a good thing. Hey, Ryan, thanks for being with us today. Hey, thank you, Dave. Always a pleasure. You're going to come back and talk about uh, building wealth, right? Strategies for building wealth. I'm in. I'm looking forward to that. Nick, our young investor down there. Did you learn some stuff? I, I learned a lot. And uh, my key takeaway is make money work for you. I love it. I love it. All right. All right, everybody. That's been a real meaty two weeks, but it gives you an awful lot to think about. Those of you that are true uh, TFWPers here are going to be walking around going, oh my goodness, what a different way to think about stuff. Thank you to both the guests today, to the announcer, Nick, to Ryan. Stay with us. We've got some more good stuff coming your way next week. This is Dave Hagan, and you've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Remember, Dave will randomly draw from the submitted questions and pick the winner of a free one-hour personal conversation with Dave to help you achieve your financial goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications or share the podcast via the app with your family and friends. This is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.